We're a week away from tax day. Maybe about the time you're wondering, where do my tax dollars go in Idaho? Like specifically? Well, we're about to show you the money. It's a fast and furious Boise River right now, and it's about to get faster and furious, sir. We're gonna share the warnings and the historical significance to this year's river runoff. Speaking of history, KTVB's platinum anniversary is right around the corner. So we're celebrating with another of our favorite stories from the Channel 7 Vault. What there was to see and do decades ago and today. Perhaps you've seen the headlines. Public trust in government near historic lows. This is according to the Pew Research Center over the, over the years they've been keeping track, dating back to 1958. It peaked in October 1964, by the way, at 77% and has seen a steady decline since. A little bit of a bump right after 9-11, but that downward trend picked right back up. And, of course, the pandemic didn't do too much to stop it. The current low, lowest point would be August of 2011. And the current confidence level right now is around, around 20%. Pew Research sh survey shows about 20% of Americans think the government does the right thing always or most of the time. Only 20%, so a lot do not. In the middle of this mistrust, Idaho state controller is hoping to change that by being more transparent on such things like taxes. Here's Joe Paris. If you want to play elected official word association, Idaho State Controller Brandon Wolf would likely select the word transparency. You know, it's my passion and it's been from day one and it continues this day and I hope that passion comes through. Wolf has served as state controller since 2012. His role is basically managing Idaho's financial affairs. A major project Wolf has worked on for a decade, showing the people of Idaho where their tax dollars go in the government and what the financial status of it all is. The biggest part to me is building trust. And we've seen the trust in government has gone down at an all time low everywhere we look, everywhere we see social media, anywhere we look at it, uh, people are like, I don't know if I trust them. Feds, the state, our local government. And so that's my biggest opportunity is how can we build that trust back up? Enter Transparent Idaho, a web page and website that Wolf and his team have taken great pride in developing in recent years. Here you can see details of government spending and finances at the state level, and it breaks down across all the agencies. But now Transparent has a new fancy new feature, one Idahoans has asked for, local government breakdowns. My vision was always how do we get local governments involved as well. There's 44 counties, 199 cities, 186 school districts and charter schools, 800 plus taxing districts. And so you sit there and think about how many times you're gonna to have to click to go to every one of those. But my vision is there one way we could put all of that information on one site on Transparent Idaho. Wolf says through great partnerships with Idaho's county clerks, Transparent Idaho can now show you detailed financial and spending info for every individual county. There you can also compare and contrast, creating a point for local policy discussions. It can be complicated data to go through on its own, but Wolf and his team work to change that. I joke, though my grandma's passed away, I always say I want to make this as easy that my grandma can use this and make it accessible. Um, and make it so that whether you have some understanding in a particular area that's of interest to you, whether it's transportation or fish and game or local government, I want to make it easy that any citizen can be able to dive in and look for it and maybe even get carried away on a rabbit hole and go down here and spend days and hours like I do. The idea here is transparency across the board, a helpful tool for having major debates and discussions on all levels. And, and we want more citizen engagement. That was a big driver of all this as well. So not only can I compare my neighboring counties, but I can compare to say, how do we fit and what can we learn from these best practices? Maybe this county sheriff, how much are they spending? And how's that compared to our county? And we can call them up and say, hey, what are you doing? It looks like you're doing a great job. How can we imp implement that, those best practices? And Wolf says the work doesn't stop here. Soon, more hyperlocal data and tools will be added. The big part is we're just going to add more and more and more. And being able to put those metrics to say, how much are we spending on roads and bridges per mile compared to this area and that? And as we add more and more, I think that'll just build the trust. You know, we want to deter any fraud. We want to change the culture of what this data means. And, uh, you know, uh, Justice Brandeis back in 1914 said, sunshine is the best disinfectant. If we open up the books, we shine the lights, hopefully that in the long, big scheme, we mix all this all up together, is really is to build that trust back up in government. 
And the controller's office says that the data goes even further as reporting statewide education and school district spending. And while the information has always been available through public records requests, you could get a digital copy. This now gives every citizen a very in-depth look at how their tax dollars are being spent and what's being accomplished with that spending. And um, it's actually interesting, Brian, in 2021, they created a, a uniform approach to city, county, and districts in the Idaho legislature. So this is in law that they're starting to work on stuff like this. And it's not just uh, tax information on that Transparent Idaho website. One thing that they also worked on during COVID, for example, is town hall meetings. There's been questions about, well, where are all the town hall meetings posted across Idaho? Everything's on that Transparent Idaho page, and we have it linked on our website, ktvb.com. I was just playing on the data page. It's interesting. You, you get to see where it all goes. When, and as you said, you could have requested that, and it was timely. It would cost some money and some time. It wouldn't you know, come right at you. But to have it just readily available, that's pretty significant. And when they fill those public records requests, usually it's spreadsheets of thousands and thousands of rows of data, and specialists work to give the, the results that are requested. And that takes a lot of time. This, I can go log on right now. Go take a look. Digestible. All right, thank you very much, Joe. You know, we've been talking a lot about Tree Fort lately. What about its little sister? That'd be the Flipside Fest. You've heard of that one? Today, organizers over at Duck Club Entertainment announced the music and the Art Fest is back this year. And to get you excited about it, check out the fun from the first ever Flipside Fest, which was last year. The idea kind of came from the fact that, well, for one, we did Tree Fort in September last year because of the, the pandemic. Enjoyed doing September, but we, re, we, re, we really liked Tree Fort in March. So you can listen to music, you can come get food. Can you throw the onions and lettuce on there for me? Yeah, it's really cool to see them use this space, you know, because we're literally right here on the water and I think that it's such an incredible opportunity for people to come in on their bikes and walk in. It was busier than a normal Friday night for us. I think Garden City is kind of shifting in people's minds as more of these young businesses are here. So economically, I think that, you know, we've you know, been here five years, so we've been very grateful for, to the community for helping us survive those five years. We couldn't do it alone. but. I think more importantly, we're trying to create this community. And so I think there's a synergy there between the economics and actually having a community that comes back. So our hope is that people will discover these places and you know, sure, there'll be short-term e economic impact over this, this weekend, but the long-term, these people, more, more folks will know that these places are down here and what to experience. It's cool, like vibrant neighborhood. All right, so the weekend they're talking about, that's coming up in September. That's when the festival will be held, September 22nd through the 24th in Garden City. They expect 80 bands over that festival weekend. Tickets are going to go on sale this Friday at a discount, but only for Duck Club email subscribers. Anyone else, you can buy those tickets starting May 1st, and you can find more information about those tickets on our website, ktvb.com. All right, we mentioned this before, but 
our 70th anniversary as a station, KTVB. That's coming up this summer. So we're leading up into it, going into the KTVB archives to dig up some of the gems of the gem state, including one of our old shows called Exploring Idaho. It ran for five years, from 1993 to 1998, and showcased Idaho's unique beauty and adventure in hopes to inspire some exploring of your own. So today, we're taking you back to April of 1995, where former anchor Dee Sarton takes us to the Bruno Dunes State Park. Bruno Dunes, the tallest single structure sand dune in North America at 470 feet high. It rivals dunes found in the Sahara Desert. Dee calls it Idaho's Little Sahara. As the morning sun breaks onto the horizon, the birds of Bruno Dune State Park send out a shrill wake-up call. Except for the getting up clatter of nature, mornings are pretty calm on the dunes. Their slinky shapes meander across the skyline. But as the morning wears on, the wind gets to work, leaving its imprint in the shape of each dune. Why don't the dunes just blow away? And where did all this sand come from in the first place? Bruno Dunes State Park manager Wes Whitworth is used to questions like that. 10 to 12,000 years ago, the Bonneville flood came through this region. It was the second largest flood in the world. And this was kind of a big eddy in that flood. And the water slowed down in that time and slowed down enough to deposit the sand and then the winds have blown it in here into this natural trap that we call Eagle Cove here. The dunes don't blow away or even move around much because the wind in this area comes from two prevailing directions, approximately 180 degrees apart. The opposing winds play a game of tug of war, a game that never ends and that neither side ever wins. It's got a first footstep quality every time you come out. The sand erases everyone else's tracks, so each time you go up, it's like you're the first person that's ever been there. Even on a windy day, you'll find visitors to the park. The wind's incredible today. A lot of times you can come out here and it's not too windy, but the wind is what makes the place unique. Todd Olson's climb will be worth the work. His snowboard is about to become a sandboard. It's like the wettest, sloppiest snow you ever had. <laughs> it's really heavy, it's hard to turn, but you can get some good speed. And sooner or later, just about everybody ends up head over heels in all this sand. Yeah, you get sand in places you never knew you had. <laughs> if you have kids, plan on it. Undoubtedly, you'll take some sand home with you as a memento of the good time everybody had. Kids go crazy out here. They really enjoy playing on the dunes. There's a lot for them to do. They can hike through the desert, play on the sand, or fish in the lakes. It's just a really a beautiful location for kids. The lakes, of course, add a different outlook because you can canoe, enjoy the birds, the wildlife. We get a lot of migrating geese and ducks and the trumpeter swans. We get a few of those that come in here. And and rest. But Wes Whitworth's best advice is to take the time to sit and really see all the area has to offer for yourself. It's much more than a giant sandbox. Sand is very photogenic. The dunes are just uh, very subtle and very unique. The scenery changes everywhere you go in the park. of the state of Idaho. It's very unique to the country and to the world. Well, things have certainly changed out there because there's also a pretty popular observatory at the Bruno Sand Dune State Park built about five years after that Exploring Idaho episode first aired. 
It held just one telescope until, well, just recently. They're supposed to open the observatory for the season mid-May with the addition of a second telescope. They also have observatory nights every Friday and Saturday through the summer. The park is open every day for day use. Campsites are now open for the season as well. We'll be highlighting more of these unique stories in the days to come, but if you want more right now, you can find all of our Exploring Idaho's on our KTVB YouTube page, or you can find them at KTVB+. After a really nice morning this morning, we're starting to feel and see those changes coming into play. Trees rocking pretty good here and the breeze that's it's sustained winds anywhere from 15 to about 25 miles per hour through the Treasure Valley. What a difference a day makes from record warmth yesterday. We're close to 25 degrees below where we were just 24 hours ago. That cold front hasn't made its way through the Magic Valley just yet, but it is on its way in that direction. Still holding out near 70 degrees in Twin Falls and Jerome, but we're in the 50s in the Treasure Valley and tomorrow it'll be even cooler in the afternoon with breezy conditions coming in out of the northwest. That adds a bit of a chill to how it feels, especially because we have mostly cloudy skies in store for us tomorrow as well. A look at the timeline for the rest of this evening into the overnight hours. You know our lows this morning were in the mid 50s, so big changes. Probably not sleeping with the windows open overnight tonight and then tomorrow afternoon we're looking for highs to be in the low to maybe the mid 50s for the Treasure Valley. This is the cooler air that's coming into play and while maybe it's not the best gardening conditions this is going to mitigate that flooding risk as it slows down our melting process with our healthy snowpack in the mountains for a few days with our cooler than average temperatures sticking around with us through the end of the work week 52 for a high tomorrow in Boise here's a look at the seven day forecast for the Treasure Valley area we get lots of sunshine back in across the region on Friday and return to spring 60s and 70s this weekend with a chance of some showers heading into the beginning of next week. And we'll, uh, you can always find this forecast at KTVB.com. Brian?
All right, warming temperatures this time of year. You likely notice the Boise River is rising as well. Not unusual, as I said, and with the rain and snow melt making room for reservoirs in the future for the future, I should say they got to get rid of some of that water. You might have also noticed how quickly that river has jumped up a week ago. We were sitting at around 600 cubic feet per second at the Glenwood Bridge measuring point downriver. But last Thursday we were above 2000 CFS and today we're above 3100 may make for some great surfing at the Boise wave, but not a good time to get in the water for those just looking to take a dip. Boise Fire Department reminding people to stay out of the river today and over the next several days. The river is fast, cold, and the water has debris that can cause injuries. The riverbanks may also be hazardous as they can be slippery and soft. And because of the fast, flow, fast flowing river, should you get in and get in trouble? Well, river access by potential Boise Fire Rescue Team that could also be compromised. That kind of warning this time of year, kind of like the water levels, pretty common. But the last few years, there we haven't been as high as we are seeing this year. Last year, the river crested at about 2,840 CFS in the middle of June. Late May in 2021 and only around 2,200 CFS. How about 2020? Boise River reached its peak at only 1,000 CFS on the last day of April. It's quite the contrast from 2017 when it peaked above 9,500 CFS in early June. You can see the graph there. That was the second highest crest ever recorded. Highest would be 1983, nearly 10,000 CFS. Good to remember, flood stage on the Boise River is 7,000 CFS. 2019, you can see there on that list, also good enough for the top 10. So let's go back to that spring of 2017. It certainly stands out. And while there, this season is really nothing like that season, there are some similar elements, which is why we're taking a look back at the fallout of what many of us remember as the winter of Snowmageddon. It was only six years ago when we were watching what a well above normal winter snowpack in the Boise Mountains would mean for the Boise River that spring. This is what it looked like for April 1st of 2017. And this is what that snowpack looks like this week. Pretty comparable with both years well above average. So what did that mean for 2017? Well, early season rains and early release of water to make room for what would soon be running into the reservoirs made for early rising levels of the river. The Boise River hit flood stage, flowing at 7,000 cubic feet per second by March 6th. I've never seen it like this before. Yeah, this is brand new to us. And it kept rising. We got a shoreline that we never had before. <laughs> reaching 7,150 CFS the following day with water reaching bridges and backyards. Water continues to flow just outside these homes. Taking out trees and sections of the Greenbelt. Oh, this is historic. Within weeks. I don't know if we've reached the peak of what the river is going to um, reach this spring and early summer. That peak was reached that June, cresting at 9,590 CFS on June 6th. It would stay above flood stage until mid-June. Because of that, officials say float season will not be kicking off in late June like it typically does. The Boise River has to get below 1,500 cubic feet per second for floating. And at 9,500 CFS, Ada County Parks and Waterways Director Scott Coburg says they've got a long way to go. All bets are off as far as what to expect. That didn't happen until late July, the latest start to a float season ever. And that wasn't the only pinch put on Ada County coffers. Cleaning up would be costly. Countywide, when you look at everything, definitely in the millions. A lot of money spent. FEMA money was used to make the necessary repairs following all that flooding. Some of it anyway. We're not saying we are heading that direction this spring by any stretch. As we showed you, we're nowhere near the river levels. We were those high water years. But the Boise River is expected to peak this week around 4,500 CFS and stay around that number through next week. So be careful out there. And speaking of high water levels, they're flooding over in eastern Oregon right now because of that. Oregon Department of Transportation said rapid snow melt is causing water over the highways, specifically sections of US 395, B and C, US Highway 26 and other roads in Grant County. Some of the roads in Harney and Malheur County are affected as well. They said do not try to drive through any of the deep water you see on the road. So you're probably saying, well, how do I know if it's too deep to drive through? Unless you're driving a boat, just don't. You likely don't know how deep it is, so use common sense and be safe.
All right, you know, for our tax transparency story we did today, we talked a little bit about public trust and government based on the Pew Research. And, uh, well, Paul said this, I'd like to find 20% of the people that believe the government does right 100% of the time. I have an investment opportunity they do not want to miss out on. That's a good point. Yeah, if you believe that, there's probably some beachfront property in Arizona or a bridge somewhere, I'm sure. Okay, so today's National Pet Day, and all the other shows have been asking for pictures of your pets to send in. We got this one where I think it was Paul who tried to send in a picture of Molly and Kiko. This is what he sent in. This is it. That was it. It's just a repeat. He tried, didn't do so well. We don't see Molly and Kiko, but we do see the mishap that happened. There it is. All right. That's all we got for you. We'll see you tomorrow.